was on the water. And yesterday I was out on the water and I kept seeing all these bees and they were struggling and they couldn't fly. So I would pick them up with my kayak paddle and I'd put them on the front of my kayak and they would take time and they would rest, right? And then they would take off and fly. And God reminded me in that moment that he will pick us up when we're struggling and he will give us the rest that we need so that we can fly. So this morning, praise him with your voice and thank him for giving you the rest that you need to start today.
was great is his faithfulness. And it's moment by moment, not always morning by morning. Some of you left your houses on this morning. Someone else did too, and they didn't make it here. It's moment by moment that his faithfulness is great. Every moment that we breathe, great is his faithfulness over and over again. As we were singing this again, we've sung this this morning already. But this is another opportunity to give him praise once again. Because he let me make it through the last hour, through the last second, through the last minute. Great is his faithfulness unto us. Hallelujah. This is why we give him praise. We don't do it for anyone in this building. But great is his faithfulness. Hallelujah. As we go into this next song, we're going to talk about fear and the future that you have. Not the person beside you because there's nothing that you can do for them. It's all God. As we go into this song, open up your heart to what God is wanting to pour into you on this morning. Whether you're walking here dragging and down in the burdens, let it all go. Open your hearts to receive what God wants to give to you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
eternity is going to go. And I just pray for the spirit to continue to move in this place. I pray for the word. I pray for pastor that he brings, that he brings the word. And I pray that our spirit is willing to receive it. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing today in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would please turn your attention to the screen and take your seat.
Well, good morning, church. Y'all good today? Come on, you thankful for the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Give him a hand clap of praise. I'm excited to be with you today as we wrap up our series called what? Running Yellow Lights. Come on, if you've enjoyed this series, let me hear it. The grace of God is real. The grace of God is good. The grace of God sometimes is everything that you need. You know, I think sometimes we put God into a category that puts a lid on what he's capable of doing. I think sometimes what we do is we take a God and we say, I know that God is real. I know that God is present in my life. I just don't know how much he can do. And we begin to do this thing called doubt. We doubt the presence of God. We doubt what God is capable of. Of doing. You know, we as human beings, we have a tendency to doubt God for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's for something you've walked through. Maybe it's because of the circumstance you find yourself in today. But I need you to understand something. You ever realize that sometimes when I begin to doubt God, the other parts of my life become a little more chaotic? The other parts of my life feel a little bit more out of control. The moment that I'm not right where I should be with God, I'm not right where I should be in the other parts of my life. How many know God brings a balance to your life? God did not create you absent of him. God created you in, in, in the likeness of him. Therefore, when I remove him from my life, the things that are dependent on his presence become a little bit more out of whack. So I need the presence of God in my life. Even when I doubt him. See, the thing about doubt is this. When I take doubt and I make that my priority when my, in my relationship with God, that doubt leads me to something called what? Fear. See, and I become fearful. When I doubt God, I doubt my future. And when, my, and when I doubt my future, I become uncertain of what my future will look like. And you know, we as people, we just got a thing about the unknown. We don't like it. We like to know, we like to make sense of what tomorrow is going to look like. And the moment we don't have that, it becomes fearful to us. But what do we know about fear? Fear robs us of what? Faith. Fear robs us of faith. And when I live a life absent of faith, you know what I start doing? I start rushing through it. I start moving faster. I start taking on more things. I start going to, 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 to do more projects and more work and, and all the things that I said one time in my life I wanted to, to cut back on so that I could make room for God. The moment I start to doubt him, I begin to take more of those things on. Sometimes we'll allow ourselves to become busier, to distract us from the idea that maybe I'm doubting who God is. You ever rushed it? Let me ask you this. You ever woke up and like you look at your clock, let's say, you have to be at work at like 8 o'clock. And let's just say you wake up and it's 7.56. Right? And so you have that moment where you panic and you're just like, I got to be at work in three minutes. And so you start getting yourself ready and going through the process. And, and here's what I, I'll tell you. This, what I've learned in this moment of, of being in panic is um, my wife, so, Danielle, I love her. She can take three hours to get ready or three minutes to get ready. And it looks exactly the same. And I'm like, how did you, first off, how'd you do it? Second off, why are we doing the three hours, right? Because you just showed me that we can do this faster. And so you get yourself ready, you go through the process, you get in your car and you go, oh boy, like I'm making up time and I get into my car and I'm flying down the street. Mm. And then there's, a, there's that intersection that has that light. You all know it. That one that lasts for about 14 days. <laughs> and you see it. And you know it's coming and it's green. And you're like, praise the Lord that this light is green. And so you're like, I got to get through it. You start going and all of a sudden, boop, turns yellow. And you know, boom, and you start taking off, boy. And you're about to blow through that light. But there's a car in front of you that decides to do the right thing. Stopping at the lights. 
and all of a sudden your saved self turned unsaved real quick and you start saying some things to that person in front of you because the light turned yellow. You know, the crazy thing about that situation is this, though. That light turning yellow, that wasn't your problem. The problem was all the things that happened before you got to the light. It was the snooze button. It was those lost keys. It was the spilled coffee. It was those angry kids. It was the lack of sleep. See, hear me when I say this. The light... It didn't dictate your peace. It just exposed the parts of your life that have none. <laughs> Let me say it for the people on the back. <laughs> See, the light, it didn't dictate your peace. It just exposed the parts of your life that have none. How many know this? God's grace is that way too. See, when I came to the light, here's what happened. The light was designed to turn red to protect me from getting damaged by something that might be crossing through. So when I came to the intersection, that light was designed to protect me. It didn't dictate anything about where or where or not I found peace in my life. It just protected whatever I brought to it. See, the grace of God is there to protect what I bring into the grace of God. The grace of God changes nothing about what you did before you encountered it. The grace of God protects what I've brought into it. Y'all ready? <laughs> you know, the, the apostle Paul writes this, Philippians 4, verse 7, it says this. Look what Paul writes. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will do what to your hearts and minds? Will do what? Doesn't say change at all, does it? Meaning what? Meaning that what I bring into it, that's what it's going to be guarded. It says that, that, that the peace of God, which transcends anything you can make sense out of, transcends all comprehension, all understanding, that guards your hearts and your minds. And so God's grace does what? It brings us peace. And then peace brings us transformation. How? By protecting the things that matter most. By allowing me to bring things into the grace of God that matter most to me. Church, hear me when I say this. God's grace is upon your life to protect the things that you surrender to God. If I don't surrender it to God, God's grace can't protect it. See, some of us, here's what we're doing. We're trying to keep our hands on the things in our life. And I'm trying to keep my hand on everything that I want to control. And then I'm going to blame God when it doesn't work out the way I want it to work out. And here's the truth. It wasn't that you can blame God. It's that you never took your hands off of it. You never surrendered it to God. This isn't a God problem. This is a you problem. It's a control problem. You weren't willing to let go of the things that you knew needed to be surrendered to God. And now you're saying, I guess God's grace isn't on this. I guess God's not real. It's not that God's not real. It's that you haven't surrendered to a real God yet. So today, for the final message in running yellow lights, I want to call the message today guardrails. Guardrails. Look at the person next to you and say, keep your guard up. Guardrails. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 18 today. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14 in the book of Genesis. And here we see Abraham. He's, he encounters three men that the Lord sends to communicate to Abraham from the Lord. And he's having a conversation with these three men. And it says this in Genesis 18, verse 9 through 14. It says, where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out. You ever tell yourself that? 
You're like, after I'm here, this is what we're going to do? Here's what we're going to walk into now at this stage of my life? She says, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? You ever realize in this story, the angel doesn't go to Sarah? Sarah was the one laughing. Why does the, why does the angel go to Abraham? Can I just say this? If you're not leading your family, it's time to take it very serious. Can I just say this? If you have children and you're not leading your children, it's time to take it very serious. Because it was Sarah that laughed, but God didn't go to Sarah and say, why did you laugh? God went to Abraham and said, why did your life, wife laugh? Why does Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year. And Sarah will have a son. So here we have Sarah and Abraham. Angel of the Lord appears to them and says, in one year you will have a son, even in your old age. And I think Sarah acts like a lot of us. Doubt it, God. I understand what you're telling me. I understand what the promise says, but I don't know if you know me. God. I'm sure there's a lot of other people who could do what you're saying is going to happen better than I can. I don't know if you know who you're talking to. I don't meet the qualifications of being able to do what it is that you're saying. You ever realize like how quick we doubt the promises of God if those promises challenge who we are today? Like the moment I get a promise from God, but it doesn't look the way I look today, I will begin to doubt God before I begin to doubt me. Because I don't want to get out of who I've become comfortable being. You ever realize it's a lot easier for me to stay comfortable in who I've learned to be instead of moving into who I'm being called to be. And the Bible says that Abraham and Sarah, they hear the promise from God. And Sarah does what? Laughs. Why? Sarah is more focused on who she is in this moment instead of who she can become alongside God. I just believe that there's people here right now, you're caught up in who you are today, not in who God can make you into tomorrow. And so she hears it and she laughs. And she doesn't believe the miracle is possible. Come on, church. I just need to say this to somebody that God is able to work a miracle in your life to fulfill his purpose in your life. And God is not looking at the broken person sitting here today. God is looking at who he's going to make you into tomorrow. God's not giving you purpose based on what you look like today. God's not giving you an assignment based on who you are today. God's giving you assignment based on who he's calling you to become. God's not short-minded. God doesn't have narrow vision. God understands what he created you to do, even if you can't see what you were created to do. Your limitations, your inability to see your own capacity does not limit God's ability to see your capacity. You know why? Because God created you, you didn't. And so God says, I'm going to work a miracle in your life to Sarah. Even though Sarah couldn't make sense of the method. <laughs> and that's important. Because church, if today you're focusing on the method, you might miss the miracle. If you're looking at your life and you're saying, based on where I am today, I know this is possible, but I don't think that is. Understand me, you're focusing on the method, not the miracle. If God promised it, God will do it. God is not limited based on what you can do. You're expanded based on what God can do. And so Sarah, she laughs and she says, how can this be? How can you really do what you're promising to do if I'm in this state? And I got to ask the church this morning, what limitation are you placing on yourself that is keeping you from the miracles of God? What areas of your life are you focusing more on the method than you are on the miracle? 
Because those are the areas of our lives where we will complain and we will say, God's not coming through. And God's saying, no, you're just trusting yourself more than you're trusting me. What limitations are you placing on yourself? Right now, this morning, that's causing you to doubt the faithfulness of God. So today, I want us to look at three what I would consider guardrails that keep us grounded when we begin to doubt God's faithfulness. And the first guardrail is this, the guardrail of possibility. The guardrail of possibility. You know, it's no secret in this story that Sarah's a little caught off guard by what God promises her. It actually says that she laughs out loud. She LOLs God. In this moment, laughs out loud at the promise. Why? Because the promise seems so impossible. And I need you to understand there, there are going to be moments in our lives where God shows up in our stories. God shows up in our lives and what he promises to do in your life will seem impossible. And we will begin to doubt God's capability based on what we deem possible or impossible. And God just has a way with taking the impossible and making it possible, but that doesn't make it easier for us to comprehend it. This is not just a Sarah Abraham problem. This is a us today problem. This is also a New Testament problem. Think about this. When Jesus goes back to, to heal his friend Lazarus, to raise him from the grave, famous story in the Bible, what happens? Well, think about it. So Jesus, his friend Lazarus, he gets sick. And Mary and Martha, the, bro the sisters of Lazarus, they say, they, they call out for Jesus and they say, Jesus, we need you to come heal your friend. Your boy's sick. And Jesus says, on my way, just going to do it on my time. And so he begins the process of going to see Lazarus, but he delays it. And he waits a couple days. And then by the time he gets to see Lazarus, Lazarus is what? He's dead. And there's a moment here where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, she hears that Jesus finally got here. And she's got some words for him. <laughs> Look what it says. John chapter 11, verse 32. It says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, like I want to put it in perspective, the moment that Mary's having. She doesn't see Jesus coming down the road and say, wow, it's Jesus. Like, I got, like her brother's dead behind her. And from what she was told, the man walking in was able to fix that. And so this isn't a, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you for a second? This is a, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not be dead. I love this moment. Because I think it's exactly how we treat Jesus so often. Jesus, I prayed. I did what you told me to do. I walked the process out. I took the steps the Bible tells me to take. I prayed, I called out for you, I came to you, I got on my knees for you. Why didn't you come when I asked you to come? That's the conversation. Mary and Martha allow the limitations of what they think is possible to put a lid on what they think God can do. You know what's crazy about this story? Is Mary, if she had it her way, Jesus would have healed a sick man. But Jesus didn't come to heal a sick man. Jesus came to raise a dead man. See, understand what we're saying. You might be asking God to do something in your life, and you might begin to doubt him because he hasn't come through the way that you've asked him to come through. But Jesus might be looking at you and saying, I didn't come to heal a sick man. I came to raise a dead man. 
I didn't come to answer the prayer in the way you've asked me to answer it. I came because there's a greater purpose beyond your understanding that I have to come here to do. Mary almost interrupted one of the greatest miracles in the entire Bible. Why? Because she wanted God to operate on her terms instead of trusting God with his. Jesus wasn't coming to heal a sick man. Jesus actually delayed so that he could raise a dead man. Church, church, we serve a God who is constantly working miracles in your life that you don't see yet that bring him the greatest glory. And yet we will doubt him because his method doesn't fit our logic. And I need to speak this to someone because there's a lot of people who think I got it figured out. And the moment I hear anything that I don't already know, I turn my nose up at it. Why? Because it's easier for me to reject you than feel insecure. God forbid I go someplace and learn something new. That would make me feel insecure. I need to know what it is you're talking about before you talk about it because then that makes me feel important. And in this moment, Mary wanted to know how it would work not trust how it would work. Church, hear me. Stop trying to fit God into the logic of your mind and start allowing your mind to fit into the logic of God. Let me help you with it. You can't comprehend what God's gonna do. Let me just give you a spoiler alert. You can't wrap your mind around the grace of God on your life. You can't understand or comprehend what God wants to do with your life. You can't even make sense out of the way the grace of God is on your life right now. How that when everyone around you who thinks you're done, who thinks you're counted out, who thinks you have nothing left, when everyone around you begins to tell you that, God comes alongside of you and he says, child, I'm just getting started with you. Child, I'm just beginning with you. I got a whole life ahead of you that you don't even know existed. Stop disqualifying me based on what they look like and start walking in the promises I have for your life you know we have a core value here at one city we have the grace core values and the E in grace stands for what expect the unexpected she gets it <laughs> expect the unexpected. <laughs> Hear me when I say this, church. God is not only doing the impossible in your life, but it's time you started expecting the impossible in your life. See, when we say expect the unexpected, what we're saying is that we allow the presence of God, we allow God to come into our life and turn the unexpected into what we expect. Why? Because when God grabs a hold of you, when God's grace begins to transform you, when God's grace begins to change you, understand, through you, God can do things you could never do yourself. God will do things through you that you would never have the capacity to do, the capability to do, but it's through the grace of God that you can begin to expect the unexpected. God wants to do the impossible through you. Do you know why? Because if it was possible, you could take the credit. It's the impossible. The things you don't have the capacity to do. That brings God the most glory. And God doesn't do this so that you can have a better tomorrow or better today. God doesn't do this so that you can just get out of whatever situation you're in right now. God comes alongside of you and does the impossible so that you never forget what God's grace is capable of in your life. So that you never forget when God came alongside of you and pulled you out. Do you know why? Because if you needed grace today, you're going to need grace tomorrow. That that same God that pulled you out of the circumstance yesterday, you're going to need tomorrow. And that's the second guardrail that keeps us steady in our doubt. Not only is it the guardrail of possibility, 
but it's the guardrail of God's faithfulness. The guardrail of God's faithfulness. You know, another reason that doubt will begin to come into our life, specifically within our faith, is when I don't believe God can do what he promised us he can do. And so if I don't believe that God can use me for what it is he says he's going to use me for, I'll begin to doubt him. And how many know this? Sometimes it's easier to doubt God than it is to doubt ourselves. We are prideful people. We can't love the world and God because the things of the world, what? Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and self-pride. So we're prideful people. And so sometimes we begin to doubt God because we can't make sense that God can use us in the way that he promises to use us. And maybe right now, someone in this room, you're doubting God, not because of, of, of something that, that, that has happened in your life, not because of a circumstance you're in. You're doubting God because you've been praying for a very long time for God to do something and he just hasn't done it yet. Just like Mary, it wasn't on your time. And so now you doubt that God's ever gonna show up. And this is important because you need to understand doubt is a part of your faith. Like it comes with the territory. I don't get to walk into faith and never doubt God. Do you know why? Because the moment you begin to experience the enormity of God, it is outside of your comprehension. And when it's outside of my comprehension, I will begin to doubt the things that I don't know. And so just the, the pure enormity of who God is will bring doubt into your faith because you can't comprehend what God can do. God is so much more than just what you know. He's so much more than just what you see around you or what you experience in your life. And so doubt will come in. And it's in these moments we have to learn from Abraham again. And before Abraham has this conversation with these three angels about his son, a little bit earlier in chapter 12, we see... God tell Abraham that his people, his chosen nation, would walk into the promised land. And look what it says in Genesis chapter 6, or chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. It says, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And at the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and, Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so Abraham has another encounter with God, and God says, I'm going to raise up a people, and I'm going to give them this land, and I promise that you will take possession of it. And what does Abraham do? He doesn't celebrate. He doesn't say, oh, I'm going to church Sunday, I'm singing loud. No. It says that he builds an altar. Why would he take the time to build the altar? So that every time he came to that place, he never forgot the way God showed up. And here's what's so powerful about an altar. Not only would Abraham never forget that God showed up, but everyone who came after Abraham, the generations to come, would come to the altar and also never forget that this was the place that God showed up. Come on, somebody. Come on, listen, I don't need you to figure out how to pray better. I need you to remember better. I don't need you to figure out how to speak in tongues in a way that sounds better than the person next to you. I need you to build an altar. I need you to remember the places in your life where God showed up, when everyone counted you out, when it made zero sense for you to be where you are today. When God showed up in that moment, that's what you need to build an altar to. That's what you need to remember. That's where your faith comes from. Not from what you haven't encountered yet, from what you have. From the moment you've already walked through. Because when I encounter the goodness and the grace and the faithfulness of God in my past. I have everything needed to expect it in my present. It's not about getting more spiritual. Discipleship comes. Sanctification is a lifelong process. This is about just remembering what God's already done for you. Remembering what he's already brought you through where you've already encountered his grace. I know that's a part of your life you don't open up to anyone because it makes you feel nervous and insecure. It doesn't mean God wasn't there. 
Here's the question today, church. What do you need to remember? What altars do you need to build? Where do you need to put a mark on the grace of God in your life? Because I can tell you this, right now in this room, there are people sitting here, and it was a season where you couldn't escape that sinful lifestyle, but you're still here. It was a season where you couldn't imagine your heart being restored after a broken family, but you're here. It was that moment where you couldn't imagine being able to move beyond that job loss or the grief of that loved one that you can't imagine life without, but you're here. Maybe it's this season where you walked in an addiction that no one knew about and it should have crippled your life, but it didn't. And you're here. (laughs) The grace of God doesn't keep me from hardships. It just allows me to build an altar when I get through them. You know what's so powerful about the grace of God? It knows things about your life that no one else knows. You can come to church looking as good as you need to. God knows the real you. God's grace is not to deal with the external that you show everyone else. God's grace is to deal with the internal that is robbing you of joy, that is robbing you of peace. That's the guardrail of faithfulness. And not only do I stay secure in my faith when I encounter doubt through the guardrail of possibility and the guardrail of faithfulness, but then there's a third one. Because when you get through whatever it is you're going through, when you encounter the grace of God, the power of that grace, when you encounter God's faithfulness, you better give glory where glory's due. Because there are promises on your life that only God can give you. And that's the third guardrail, is the guardrail of promise. The guardrail of promise. You know, the Bible teaches us That when I do encounter the power of his grace and the power of his promises, that I give him glory. And I want us to look at how the story of Abraham and Sarah's promised son comes to a conclusion. Look what it says. Genesis 21 verses 1 through 7. It says, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. Right there. Just stop. The Lord was what? Can we just get on the same page today and say every blessing that we have in our lives, none of us deserve? That we've all fallen short of the glory of God, therefore we are all worthy of the consequence of sin, which is death. And so the fact that we're here right now having this conversation is because God is gracious. It says he was gracious to Sarah, as he said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant. She bore a son to Abraham in his old age and at the very time God had promised. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him and God, as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. I love that verse 7. Who would have said? You ever looked at your life and been like, who would have thought? Who would have thought I would have got through it? Who would have thought I'd still be sitting next to the same woman today? Who would have thought that my kids would end up the way that they've ended up? Who would have thought that that God would take all these broken pieces and put them back together in a way only he could do? Who would have thought? And God keeps his promise to Sarah and Abraham. And I love this because Sarah very easily could have been like, I gave birth. I did it. God asked me to do it, and I did it. Or she could have been like, Abraham got me pregnant. He was 100 years old, and he still could do it. 
all of that would have been true. But in verse 6, you know what Sarah says? God has brought. Not Sarah. Not Abraham. God. Can I just say this to someone that today it's about time that we stop glorifying ourselves and we start glorifying God? That we stop taking credit for what only God can do and we give credit where credit is due? That was a Dr. Seuss rhyme. I didn't even... God has brought, not us. And after Sarah laughed in the face of God, when God said, I will give you a son in your old age, and she hears it, and because of the improbability, because it felt impossible, she laughs at him. And now here she is, not only looking at the blessing, but holding in her very arms the fruit of God's promise. And they named that son what? Isaac. And you know what's crazy is when I look at the name Isaac in the Hebrew and I look at the original language, you know what it means? One who laughs. She held the promise of God and she named it the very thing she did when she doubted him. That every time she would look at that promise and she would say, this is Isaac, she would be remembered or she would be reminded that she laughed at God when he said this promise was coming. Can I ask you, what are you laughing at today? What are you laughing at in your life? What is God telling you is coming into your life? What is God telling you you need to continue doing? What is God telling you you need to stop doing? What is God telling you needs to be transformed in your life? Because he has a great calling for you. And when you hear it, you're laughing. What are you laughing at today? Because today it's your turn. It's your turn to stop doubting and start believing. It's your turn to stop doubting that your family can be restored. It's your turn to stop doubting that your body can be healed. It's your turn to stop doubting that the things that are broken can be put together. It's your turn to stop doubting that you can be fixed, that you can be made whole, that you can be made righteous through the blood of Jesus. It's your turn to stop doubting and to start believing that the promises that Jesus places on your life are real, are powerful, are purposeful, and you can't disqualify yourself. Why? Because the blood of Jesus qualifies you. There's nothing you can do. It's beyond you. And for some of us, that makes us nervous because it means you don't have control over it. But for others, it'll bring you peace because you realize you don't have control over it. This is what God's grace does. It's of our doubt, in the middle of our unbelief, in the middle of our uncertainty. It meets us there, and then it transforms us from the person we were to the person God calls us to be. But it's up to you to determine what you bring into this light. You cannot continue to stay unsurrendered and then blame God for the parts of your life that are unsurrendered. It's not fair. It's not fair to you and it's not fair to God. Come on, somebody. 
Start giving God glory. I think God is about ready to start looking for people who are willing to stop glorifying themselves and start glorifying Him. I think God is about ready to find people who want to encounter breakthrough because they're going to step into what only God can do. I think God is about ready to encounter worshipers who worship authentically Jesus, not because it looks good. I think God's ready to encounter people who are willing to walk this thing out for real, that are ready to restore your family, not just make them look good on Sunday that are ready to get out of that addiction, not just put it off on Sunday, that are ready to get into the calling God has on your life, not just walk in and say, I can't wait to be called, but not be willing to step into the very calling God gives you. God is ready for you. And let me just say this, if there's anyone in here today, in this moment, and you've never encountered the grace of God personally, hear my invitation. Open your mind and open your heart to the possibilities, to the faithfulness, and to the promises of Jesus. And I promise you, you will encounter a peace you didn't even know existed. You will encounter a life that you didn't even know existed. You will walk into things that you could never take yourself into, but because Jesus is gracious, he gives us blessings that none of us deserve. Church, what are you laughing at today? What are you believing that you cannot accomplish because you're looking more at what your capacity is and not more at what God's capacity is? What do you need to receive? And whatever that answer is, here's what I'll tell you. It's still always going to start with Jesus. And I'm not saying you got to go look better. I'm not saying you got to work harder. I'm not saying you got to get answers to all the things you don't have answers about, about this whole faith thing. I'm saying you receive the free gift of salvation, the free gift of grace, the understanding that Jesus sent his only son to this world so that anyone who believed in him would be saved for eternity. That's what we're talking about today. Your sanctification, you becoming more Christ-like, we'll work that thing out together. Because why? I'm still doing it and you're still doing it. But you getting your spot secured for eternity, that's not difficult. That's simple. Do you want it or do you not? I don't care if you've been in church for years or if this is your first day. You can trick yourself to an eternity in hell by thinking you're saved but never being willing to surrender your life. Don't miss the opportunity. It's God's great gift to your life. That's the grace of God. Not only is it with you, not only is it for you, but that grace sustains you. And if you surrender to it, it will transform you. Come on, would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you for your presence, your mercy, and your grace here in this room today. Father, today we bring to you our doubts. We bring to you our insecurities. Father, we lay them at the foot of the altar. And we surrender our lives to you. Father, we thank you that you meet us in the midst of our doubt, in the midst of our unbelief. And you allow us to be called out of that doubt and into a life that is saturated with your possibilities and your faithfulness and your promises. And Jesus, I just pray that right now, if anyone in this room does not have a relationship with you, that you would just allow them to know that it is okay for them to come to you no matter what their life looks like. That you give them the gift of restoration, the gift of reconciliation, the gift of healing. And you call them by name and all they simply need to do 
is do exactly what Tananda said earlier, open the door and invite you in. And so if that's you, and maybe throughout this series or maybe today, you've realized that you are not truly surrendered to Jesus yet. Maybe today you've, you've realized that you've been just working as hard as you can to impress people and not impress God. And so if that's you, I want us to close our eyes, bow our heads. And I just believe that Jesus is speaking to people today. I believe that there's someone here that knows that they're ready to give their life to Jesus, but they just haven't had the confidence to start yet. And I'm just praying right now that you get that boldness, that you get that confidence, that you give him your life today, that you secure your place in eternity with him today, and you allow his grace and his mercy to overflow into your life. And if that's you, and you're ready to come into a true relationship with Christ, when I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand. I just believe that Jesus is speaking to you. And if you want to encounter, encounter the true gift of grace, then on three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. See 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 your hand. You can put your hands down. Father, we thank you for every hand raised today. We thank you because we don't just believe that you're going to bless them, but we believe that every hand raised today is going to encounter a supernatural peace. Father, that there is going to be rest for the first time in years, that there's going to be joy for the first time in years, that hopelessness is going to be transformed into hope, that people are going to walk out of this building today with a newfound relationship with you that gives them a hope and a future that is so rooted in you that it can only be successful no matter what it looks like father help us to trust you more than we trust ourselves with our lives and if you raise your hand today we want to pray with you but here at one city no one's ever going to pray alone so let us all pray this prayer together say dear god i admit that i'm a sinner and i need a savior I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to take our place on the cross, to die, to be buried, and to rise again, so my relationship with you can be restored. I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, therefore I'm saved. I'm a child of God, and everyone said amen and amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap praise. Can we do that real quick? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. My name is Daniel. I'm the discipleship director here at One City Church, and I got a few announcements for you today. November 5th, invite your family and friends. It's Kids Bid Hit and PJ Party. Let me reiterate that. Kids Bid Hit and PJ Party. I know Jake will look for an excuse to wear his pajamas to church. Can't happen. Kids bit hit in PJ Party. November 12th, we're going to have water baptisms during the 12 p.m. service. If you haven't signed up for that, make sure you do. It's a powerful, powerful service. And it's just, just an amazing opportunity to spend time together. First time guests in the seat back pocket in front of you, you're going to find our connection card. Make sure you fill out that connection card. And at the end of service, you can drop it in the offering bins or you can take it out to the Discover One City tent. We want to connect with you, and it's also the best way you can figure out everything going on here at One City Church. We're going to go ahead and receive our tithes and offerings. There's multiple ways to give. You can see them on the screen behind me. You can text One City to 94000. You can use the Church Center app. You can use the Cash app, handle One City Church. Go to weareonecity.com, or put your offering in the bins in the back. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we've gotten to be here with you, Father. We just thank you for your presence. Father, I just pray that we are a church that doesn't suffer from memory loss. Father, we continue to remember everything that you've done in our lives, everything that you're going to do in our lives. Lord, we trust you with it. Father, thank you for the gifts that we're about to receive. 
Lord, thank you that you're going to use them for something more powerful than we could ever imagine to transform this community and people's lives. We thank you that people's lives started fresh today, Father. We thank you that eternity was changed for them. Lord, I just pray for every person here that you protect them, that you keep them safe this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you so much for coming. We can't wait to see you next week.